Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Piancy. I'm joined as usual by my partner in crime. How are you today, Bennett? I'm doing well. How are you, Cass? I'm hanging in there. It's a little early for me today, so I, <laughs> if I look tired, it's because I am. But we're joined by a super duper special guest today. Uh, I believe this is her third time joining us. Molly White. Ah, how are you? It's so good to have you back on. I'm doing well. Uh, I'm really excited to be back. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we're having you on because you've been going to the trial uh, for Sam Bankman Freed repeatedly and uh, over and like over the course of the past week or so. Um, and like the rest of the journalists that we've had on, we were hoping to discuss what you've seen and how you felt about it and what the kind of pulse of the courtroom has been. We get to discuss with you the very final Sam Bankman Freed exam cross examination and time on the on the witness stand. So why don't we just jump in? Yeah, like the last day of testimony for Sam Bankman Freed. How did it go for Sam? What what was the what was the tone in the courtroom? It didn't go great. <laughs> <laughs> I will say, you know, I have sort of a habit of covering things that are going just great. And I would say the Sam Bankman Freed <laughs> testimony is going just great. He took the witness stand. He first did his uh, direct questioning with his defense team which went okay. And then he did cross-examination with the assistant U.S. attorney, Danielle Sassoon, which did not go well. <laughs> um, and then there was an opportunity after that point to have his defense ask a couple more questions. And, you know, he's clearly a lot more comfortable when he's talking to his own defense team, which un is understandable. I mean, like, that absolutely makes sense. Um, but he is very uncomfortable and evasive when talking to the cross examiner. And it, I think, does not go, come over like it doesn't come across well. I heard Sam Bankman Freed's memory was a little bit less than stellar, too, once he was in kind of this high pressure situation. Well, his memory was fine when he was talking to his defense attorney. I observed, you know, he was recounting events from when he was like an intern at Jane Street, which would have been almost 10 years ago at this point. You know, they were asking him about what he was and was not trained on when he was at Jane Street. And I don't know about you, but like corporate training is not the most memorable thing, <laughs> in my opinion. And so, but he's talking about, yeah, you know, we were, you know, it was really important according to the Jane Street folks that you don't ever do any front running and all this kind of stuff. And so he's telling his defense attorney about this. And then as soon as he starts talking to the cross examiner, it's like his memory just goes blank. And he's like, I don't know, you know, and he's talking about events that are significantly more recent. They were, you know, within the last year or two. And they're events that were very important. You know, it's like his company is, he thinks his company might collapse or he's trying to you know, have a conversation with someone to get funding or whatever. And suddenly it's like he can't remember it, even though you would think that might be a very memorable moment. You actually brought up there's uh, I, I think the line was um, and how how do you define market manipulation? And he said at Jane Street, it was a bad trade, which I I've never heard that definition of a of market manipulation before. Yeah. And they had to, like, stop the courtroom for a second to clarify that this was Sam Bankman Freed's definition <laughs> of market manipulation. And if at any point the jury needs like the l more legal definition, that is not what sh <laughs> they should be considering and that the judge will provide that. And this has happened several times at this point, actually, where like Sam Bankman Freed will say something that's like legal adjacent. I, I can't remember what the other thing was, but there was one other thing that this happened with too. And the judge was like, just so we're clear, this is not the legal definition of this like term that actually has a specific meaning. Um, this is Sam Bankman frees special interpretation of it. Like, why is Sam able to answer these questions from the defense team so readily? Obviously, I think everyone's aware, like, you're going to be able to answer the defense questions a little bit easier than the prosecution questions. Understandable. But I want to I want to just dissect that a bit. Right. Like, why were the questions for the defense from the defense team so much easy? In what ways were they so much easier than the prosecution's questions? Why was he unable to answer the questions appropriately from the prosecution's side? The questions from the defense attorney to Sam Bankman Freed have an entirely different purpose than the questions from the cross examiner. They are like, imagine the most softball interview you could ever <laughs> have 
they're just teeing him up for these, you know, answers about how he was so um, busy and he was working so hard and he had so much going on. And boy, he really regrets that he didn't pay more attention to what was happening. You know, and it's very much this opportunity for him to tell the good story and craft the narrative to what extent there is one um, about what happened. And so, you know, they're, they're very friendly questions and he's had the opportunity to rehearse them with his defense team for, you know, months at this point, honestly, um, because he meets with them most days and has been doing so for a long time. He meets with them when he's not throwing a temper tantrum in the jail (laughs) and just refusing to come to the meeting room. Yes, (laughs) except for those moments. But like, you know, every day, I think both maybe before and after court, he has the opportunity to meet with them. And then they're meeting on weekends. They've been prepping for months, you know, before this trial. So this is all very rehearsed. And it honestly comes off that way sometimes. You know, I think he's doing his best to seem natural when he's answering these questions. But there are portions of it where, like, you can tell he's practiced the answer. But, like, that's kind of expected. You know, that's what you're supposed to do. Whereas with the cross-examiner, these are questions that are intended to nail him. You know, they are trying to catch him in a lie or admit to something that is, you know, related to the case. They have all of this evidence to corroborate their questions. So they, you know, they're asking him questions that they already know the answer to, but they know that he doesn't want to answer them because if he does, he could you know, implicate himself in some of this wrongdoing. And so he's sitting there trying to not answer their questions while also knowing full well that they're going to say, like, do you recall saying this, blah, blah, blah. And then when he says, no, he doesn't recall, they're immediately going to pull up evidence that he said that very specific (laughs) thing. There's no winning when you're talking to the cross-examiner. Like, you're not going to answer the question in a way that they're like, oh, you know what? That actually makes sense. Like they they know the answers and they're trying to to nail you down. And so it's a very different vibe. I'm starting to think a 45 day media tour before your arrest can make it more (laughs) challenging to have an effective criminal defense. You know, it's starting to look that way. (laughs) Yeah, I was I was talking about this a little bit earlier. Like most people, especially nowadays with social media and, you know, that kind of thing have some corpus of, like, past statements that any prosecutor could draw upon. I don't know if anyone has the volume that they were provided so kindly by Sam Bankman fried when he went and spoke to all these journalists. He testified that he spoke to something like 50 different journalists during this period in, like, November to December of 2022, the period between the FTX collapse and when he was arrested. And honestly, I was like, really? Only 50? I feel like that's actually kind of low. But maybe he wasn't counting, you know, the sort of one-off people that he was chatting with or like the Twitter spaces or whatever. So He doesn't count Twitter spaces where random journalists yell at him about wire fraud. Those don't (laughs) count. I was going to bring that up because Molly was in that space as well. The two people who asked the most hard-hitting questions were you you and I, uh, Molly, and mine were hard hitting because I was yelling at him. Yours were hard hitting yes. because you were asking him good questions. And I thought yours were good <laughs> questions too. I was reflecting on the moments that we got to ask him some questions. And I was thinking like, this is so interesting to me that he thinks that that same tact of like, uh, oh, I'm going to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to confuse them and just bog them down in mindless bullshit. So I'm going to force them to not know if I actually answered the question. He seems to think that that's going to work in a court of law with a jury of his peers as well, where I'm like, that is a terrible defense strategy. They don't want you to speak to them like they're idiots. Right. Right. He has this tactic of, you know, you'll ask a question. He'll just start talking. He'll talk for a minute straight. And by the end of it, you're like, well, that had nothing to do with what I was just asking about. And he'll have gone off on something totally different. And this worked to some extent with journalists, I think. I mean, I think that it was clear when he was being evasive. It's not like people didn't notice he was doing it, but like he's not under oath. You're not doing a cross-examination. You probably don't have all this evidence just behind you ready to pull up to prove that he's made conflicting statements and he can leave at any time. Like he, I think, refused to talk to you at one point. That's not the case 
during this cross examination. He is under oath, so anything he says, you know, he could perjure himself. She's got exhibits teed up that she's spent months preparing. And anytime he goes off on this long winded rant, she can either stop him and say that he's not answering the question. Or one thing she's been doing that I think is actually really effective is she'll ask the question, he'll spend a minute yammering. And then at the end of that, he'll stop and she'll ask the question again, like basically in the same words. <laughs> and sometimes his defense lawyer will object to that saying he, you know, asked and answered. He already answered this question. And she'll say, no, he didn't. And the judge will say, no, he didn't. And then he'll have to do it again. And so not only <laughs> is that actually making him answer the question that was asked, it's also demonstrating to the jury as if they didn't already notice. I mean, this is very clear when he's doing this, but it's very much underscoring to the jury that he is trying to not answer the question, which is not a good impression to leave the jury with. <laughs> yeah, I think it was in Lewis's book, but it might have been in someone else's where Bankman Fried talked about how in interviews with journalists, he would always try to answer the question he wished they asked instead of the one they actually asked. And you see him repeatedly kind of do that with the prosecutors and stuff like that in the courtroom. And like you mentioned, Danielle Sassoon and the rest of the prosecutors are like, no, 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 that's not what I said. That <laughs> right. was not the question, Sam. No one said net asset value except for you. That's not what we're discussing, Sam. Yeah. And so that has been enjoyable to see, to see like these prosecutors really do such a good job of sticking to him as he tries to, to bullshit. Right. And he has this other thing that he does too, which has been really common, which is you'll ask him a question, you know, they'll ask him a question like, do you remember saying something to the effect of blah, blah, blah. And he'll say something like, I don't remember anything in that exact phrasing or he'll mm -hmm. say I don't remember anything during this time period where I said something like that and they'll have to come back and say like I don't care what words you said did you say anything in substance that sounded sort of like this and also at least once he's said he's tried to use that tactic and say I don't remember anything in those exact words and then they pull up evidence that he said something in those exact words so it's like okay great now you've actually completely contradicted yourself. So his usual tactics, I think, are really falling apart. And I mean, it seems kind of unbelievable that he wouldn't expect that. I think everyone expected that to play out that way. But I think he just doesn't have that level of self-reflection or something where he, he thought this might actually work. One of the moments that I keep reflecting on and makes me almost like sick to my stomach to think about if I was a defendant is that they specifically asked him about spending, I believe this was related to Zeke Fox, who is a previous guest of the show. Um, he wrote number go up. It might have been about a different journalist. Either way, the prosecution said something along the lines of like, hey, so did you say this to this journalist? I don't re I don't recall. OK, well, did you more or less say something like this to a journalist? Uh, I don't really know. I, I can't I can't I couldn't tell you. So are you suggesting that the journalist is lying? And he was yeah. like, I'm not sure. And it's just like, so really, this is you against the entire world at this point, Sam. Like, you're suggesting right. that journalists are literally making up quotes. I Like, I've never heard of any journalist worth their weight ever doing anything like that. So I, just moments like that that yeah. were earth shattering for me. Yeah, and I think that really helps to undermine his whole argument because he's obviously said at several times things that have conflicted with the testimony of various other people, including, especially including the other executives who have pleaded guilty at this point. And so he's basically saying effectively that they were lying and he was telling the truth. And now he's saying not only were they lying and he was telling the truth, but now journalists were lying and he was telling the truth. And all of these people were lying and he was the only one telling the truth. And it's like the more he does that, the less believable it is that anyone was lying because it just sounds like that's the, the strategy is he just says, oh, no, 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 everyone was lying. But like, so there was this vast com conspiracy between Carolyn Ellison, Gary Wong, Nishad Singh, and, you know, this journalist who has probably never spoken to any of those three people. 
it's just not it it's <laughs> it gets less and less credible the more he tries to use that approach it's fun to imagine what it would imply if sam bankman fried was the ceo of ftx did own this massive portion of alameda research was the director for all of these different entities signed off on each of these different documents viewed all these different balance sheets as the metadata shows and somehow was still not aware of a single crime that happened around him when he was surrounded by these felons engaged in this multi-billion dollar criminal conspiracy. Like, he's not just naive, apparently. He's just, like, blind. You could just, like, reach reach across from him and just take his wallet and he'd be like, oh, where'd my wallet go, apparently? He's just got no clue what's happening around him, is apparently, apparently what he's settled on is his defense. Yeah, and there's actually two things on that, I think, that are really relevant. So... One is I was basically doing the same exercise, which is that I was trying to imagine because right at, at this point, they're basically not trying to prevent present a narrative of their own. You know, they're not trying to say, no, no, what the defense team is saying or what the prosecution team is saying is wrong. This is what actually happened. They're just trying to say maybe the pr prosecution isn't right on this. And they're trying to poke holes in things, but they're not trying to explain what actually happened. My little exercise has been to try to piece together what they're doing would imply would have happened because they're not doing it. And so there are these points where like they're talking about the, I think the most memorable one for me is when they were talking about Nishad Singh making these transfers, backdating these transfers to make it appear as though there was $50 million more in revenue than there actually was because Sam Bankman fried desperately wanted the revenue number to be over a billion dollars for 2021. And he's saying that he had no knowledge of what Nishad Singh was doing. And Nishad just basically came up to him and was like, fix the revenue problem, boss. And then he's like, cool, sounds good. And that was it. And I'm like a imagining what would have been going on in Nishad Singh's head if that was the case. And it's like, okay, so he is committing fraud on behalf of his boss, who is not aware that he has committed fraud and has not asked him to commit fraud for no benefit of his own. Like, what is what is the story here that Nishad was like, I just feel like doing fraud today. And I like Sam so much that I'm going to make sure that he gets what he wants. Like, it's just not plausible. And then the second thing on that is you mentioned that, you know, basically his story is like, I'm a big dumb boy and I didn't realize what was going on around me. And oh, no, everyone was doing crime and I only just realized it after the fact. And he definitely was trying to make that argument. And actually during the charge hearing, I realized why the prosecution has been really pushing on that, where they're saying like, so your testimony is that you learned about this $8 billion hole that or this bug that caused it to appear as though $8 billion was missing. And you didn't ask more questions. You weren't trying to figure out what happened, you just were like, uh-oh, okay, well, I hope it's fixed, and you moved on. They went into, like, great detail asking about that, and I realized that it was because during the charge conference, they asked and were granted for a, an instruction to be added to the charge document about um, conscious avoidance, which is basically, like, oh. if you have very good reason to believe that a crime is happening and you just sort of plug your ears and look the other way, that's not really a defense. And so they drew upon this whole thing with the $8 billion bug to say that like the fact that he is a testifying, at least that he didn't ask more questions, he didn't dig into that is, you know, sufficient to add this instruction. He, they also called back to something during Nishad Singh's testimony where I think this was also related to the bug. And he said something about how he tried to have a meeting with like Caroline and maybe Gary and Sam Bankman Freed. And he said that Sam Bankman Freed basically made it up an excuse not to go to the meeting. And so based on those two things, the judge was like, absolutely, let's add this instruction. So the idea that he's just like, you know, covering his ears is is really not sufficient. That's really interesting to me because the only thing I was I kept thinking to myself, I didn't realize that that was a, a caveat that was thrown into this because everything I kept thinking in my mind was, oh, he's going for criminal negligence. They haven't charged him with that. So he's just going to desperately attempt to persuade the jury to believe that this isn't fraud. There was no criminal intent here. He wasn't trying to be a bad guy. He was unaware of all the criminality occurring in 
FTX and Alameda Research. And I think that what you're describing pretty much negates any reasonable expectation that that defense could actually fly, because the only way that he would be able to not see the problems at FTX and Alameda Research is by plugging his ears and closing his eyes. Like there, there's pretty much right. no other way that this could work out for him. So yeah, you've just negated the main defense tactic that I've been thinking about this entire time. And now I'm just curious what the hell the, the plan has been for the entire trial. Now I mean, I'm really, now I'm really confused. I think that's a great question, but I think, you know, I don't think there is much of a plan. I think they're just trying to introduce doubt wherever they can and hope for the best. But like, they they really don't have much to work with. But at least you have to feel bad for the 30-year-old child who just had no idea what was going on around him, right? I mean, all these 30-year-old children being unfairly prosecuted. But it's funny, his demeanor does come off like a sullen teenager, but not in a way that you're like, oh, maybe he is a big dumb baby. It's like, it's in a way that you're like, oh, so he's a 30-year-old sullen teenager you know it, it doesn't come off well in my opinion but there were points during his cross-examination where he looked like he was sulking and at one point he got almost like sarcastic with Danielle Sassoon which I don't think is a good strategy like that doesn't that doesn't win you any points with anyone especially not the judge I think he is immature in a lot of ways and that came through pretty clearly on the stand sarcasm being a bad tactic on the stand is why I personally have never stolen eight billion dollars I need to avoid it myself as well because I would fall apart up there I'm sure that it's not an easy place to be but I do think that all of us are aware that maybe sarcasm wouldn't be the tac tactic to uh go with in terms of trying to gar garner your freedom we probably all wouldn't we probably would have all already pled guilty so i this is yes it's, i think it, none of us would be there i mean i don't think it was an intentional tactic i think that danielle sassoon is very good at like getting under his skin i think and he at one point basically it got to him and he snapped and then he he sort of pulled it back after that i think maybe he realized that like Ish <laughs> shouldn't have done that. And so he sort of recomposed himself. And to be honest, he is more composed than I expected him to be, which is a low bar. I thought it was gonna be an absolute shit show up there. When we had Sam, Sam Kessler on, he said something quite surprising to that I am going over in my brain, <laughs> which is that Sam Bankman Fried came off like likable kind of. And I was like, that is really, really genuinely difficult for me to believe because of the mm -hmm. rounds of interviews, you know, the 50 journalists that he spoke to, the spaces, all of this stuff that he did pre-trial that I was like, oh, this guy never sounds <laughs> like a nice guy who you would want to spend time with. But Sam Kessler said when the defense team had him on the stand, he, sound, he sounded quite likable, which, I, yeah, I, I still don't quite understand that. Yeah, I think he did to some extent. I mean, it's a little challenging, sort of like you just described, for me to sort of set aside my own opinions here. But he there were points, at least, where he, you know, said something that was kind of funny or, you know, was a little self-deprecating in a way that I think probably did come off well, and which I was also surprised by. Like, that is not historically his strong suit and I think he often comes off as very arrogant or evasive like I said and so th there were points where he was able to sort of say something that was funny like they had shown the prosecution had been really hammering on this point around the extent to which he used private jets and they, during this line of questioning, showed this photograph of him asleep on a private jet where he looks very disheveled and he's asleep. And yeah, it's like not flattering. The photo is basically like up his nose. You know, it's just like not a good photo. I remember thinking when they showed that, I was like, well, that's just rude. You know, it seemed like <laughs> unnecessary, but they like to do this. They'll like illustrate the story they're trying to tell. And so when that came back up yesterday on redirect, his lawyer said something like, you recall testifying about private jets. You recall they even showed a photo of you on private jets. And he said something like, yeah, a really flattering one. And like that got a little bit of a laugh, um, at least in the overflow room where I'm in. There's there's a very big difference between the vibe and the overflow room and the real courtroom where you're not allowed to laugh. Anyway, so like there were moments like that 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 did come off well, I think. I don't know if 
on the whole, he came off as likable. Like for me, it was like there were moments. It was not overall compelling persona that he was presenting. You know, I think I think overall it was mostly evasion is what I really came away from from it with. Was there anything content wise, facts, material he was actually saying that really struck you? Facts that gave you a little bit of a different perspective on how FTX or Alameda was operating or anything that you felt was important to highlight from the actual content of what he was saying? This has been a really interesting thing because like I've been following this case so closely that basically nothing that they talked about but in during both the during any part of his testimony really was a surprise to me. There were a couple things where I learned more and not in a good way for him. Um, so one thing they gave more detail on was this incident that was in 2021, I believe, where a trader on FTX took positions in MobileCoin and a token called BTMX, and I think maybe some other things that were these very illiquid tokens, and they took this large position. And we'd already heard about this to some extent, like we knew some details about this. And there had been testimony earlier in the case, I want to say from Gary, I don't remember if it was Gary or Nishad, but one of them testified that basically there was this huge loss that FTX suffered. And they said that Sam bankman fried transferred that position to Alameda Research, basically because he wanted to hide it from the balance sheet, because FTX's balance sheet were sheets were far more public because of the investment structure there. And so by transferring it to Alameda Research, fewer people would know that there had been this loss, which was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Well, during Sam Bankman frieds testimony, he was asked a little bit more about how this happened. And he basically said that Gary Wong, Nishad Singh, and Ryan Salem learned of this position, told him about it. And for some reason, he said according to him, he said that he was going to take sole responsibility for monitoring this account. And he would make sure that, you know, if they were doing something shady, he would stop it. But if they weren't, he didn't want to like liquidate them when they didn't need to be. And so he he was like, don't worry about it. I got this. And then he did not have this. He was he said basically he dropped the ball, he wasn't paying enough attention and sure enough they were able to exploit. He said during cross-examination something about exploiting the risk engine. And I was like that's interesting. And so I was when he was talking about that, I was picturing in my head like oh there was some bug in this risk engine. It was some sort of code vulnerability that this person was able to find and exploit. Like that's interesting because that's kind of what I like to pay attention to. Well, during redirect and I still have no idea why his own team would bring this up because I feel like this just makes him seem worse but during redirect they went back to that story and he testified that it wasn't a code bug he had basically turned off the automatic risk engine for this account and was manually setting parameters on this account to try to stop them from doing anything that would lose FTX money and he messed it up so bad that they were able to make off with like $800 million. And I'm like, why would you say that? Like, why wouldn't you just let them think maybe there was a bug in the code or whatever? Because like the cross examiners didn't try to go there. You just offered this information yourself, you know, like that seems worse. So I thought that was really interesting um, because it just explains how that exp exploit happened. And it also just makes no sense to me as far as strategy is concerned. It does seem strange to highlight that your risk engine you bragged about to Congress was something you would sometimes manually bypass and in doing so cost almost a billion dollars. That right. doesn't seem like, you know, this is the risk engine the CFTC should enshrine as the default for all of crypto. You know, it doesn't seem to mesh perfectly with that when you describe right. it as I personally set the parameters. Yeah, my only guess is like, like, that he was trying to say there wasn't an issue with the risk engine and therefore the fact that I didn't disclose the issue with the risk engine is acceptable because there wasn't one. Because they had tried to ask him a little bit about the degree to which he disclosed 
the issue that had happened. And so like maybe he was trying to get around something there, but I really don't. I, I That's as best as I can guess because I, I really don't understand why he did that. It might honestly be just that like he feels like he knows the technical right answer and he's like, what you said was technically not right. Let's get the details right here. Here's how I fucked up. We gotta be, we gotta be specific here. I didn't fuck up making the risk engine. I fucked up by exempting a bunch of people <laughs> from the risk engine and not disclosing it. Let's be clear. But to be fair, this is during his redirect. His defense attorney could be like, let's stop there and just like make <laughs> him stop talking, which is probably what they should have done as far as I can tell. And they did not do that. They yeah, weren't expecting more confessions while he was on the stand. <laughs> that, that could be, yeah. They just totally caught them by surprise. That shouldn't catch them by surprise given who their client is. So the other moment that I want to call attention to as we're, as we're discussing this kind of crazy in regard to Sam's answering is this moment that Inner City Press um, posted about. I'm sure it's in the transcripts in a better better way. Um, but this is the general summary of what was said. Sas Danielle Sassoon says, these were your decisions, right? SBF says, no, I may have authorized these decisions. To which uh, Sassoon says, Anthropic, that was you? And Sam says, yes. K5, yes. The $35 million apartment, that was your decision? That particular one was. We're talking about over a billion dollars worth of bad decisions when when she brings these all up. Almost two. 1.1 to Genesis. She didn't bring up Genesis. Oh. She did bring up Genesis, but he sort of didn't acknowledge it. There was actually kind of a weird moment there where I think maybe the prosecution got confused by the fact that there are two Genesises. Mm. And so there was a little bit of confusion there. And I, I don't think he ever actually answered that question. As Bennett's pointed out to me, there's actually like 10 Genesis blocks in in, in the world. There's well, a there's bunch Genesis of blocks. There's Genesis digital yeah. assets. There's Genesis capital, Genesis trading, Genesis lending, <laughs> Genesis global, Genesis... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there were there are two that are specifically involved with the FTX trial, which is the Genesis Lender, which lent the there's three? Genesis Digital Assets, the Bitcoin miner they invested in, Genesis Block, the over-the-counter trading desk they own in Hong Kong, and Genesis Lending slash Genesis... Well, they also... Genesis Trading has come up too because they were engaged in some over-the-counter trades with them. I consider Genesis Trading and the Genesis Lender to be kind of the same thing. But yeah, I forgot about Genesis Block. But anyway, there was this, there was this pie chart and it just said Genesis on it. And he's like, I don't know which Genesis this is. And like, <laughs> it, that could have done better for sure. After all of this back and forth about whether or not Sam Bankman Fried authorized things, whether he was actually in charge, whether the CEO actually had any idea of what was going on at the company, three of the largest transactions that they ever made, she Danielle Sassoon was like, so was this you? And he's like, yeah, that was me. And you're like, okay, so sorry, what the fuck is your defense again? I'm so confused. Like, you just admitted. Yeah, it's that same thing where he's just trying to quibble over language. You know, she said something like, did you direct this investment? And he's like, I don't know if I directed it, but I probably authorized it. Or, you know, I was involved in the decision or something like he just he's just trying to get around the, the whole idea that he directed it, which I don't think is effective. You know, it's like he's he's trying to be like, well, technically, and that's just not coming across well, especially because often the technical distinctions he's making are not important at all. At one point, he tried to he tried to argue with her saying that he spent or that Alameda Research spent money. And he said, I don't know if I would put it that way. I think they used money for something, something. And she's like, so she they used money to pay the lenders. And he said, yes. It's like, so they spent money to pay the, you know it's just like a totally unimportant distinction that he was trying to draw and not useful in any way to his defense sam really just loves to embody the like first year philosophy student who doesn't really understand anything but really is loving the thrill of arguing yes there's a documentary if anyone who i i got to be in this it's it's called ruin it's a documentary about FTX by the Bloomberg Originals folks. And there's this moment where they show the George Stephanopoulos interview. And George, I think this was also shown in court. Can't uh, be and, loaned and yes. Can't be loaned out. <laughs> what? what? Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. And he's no, like no, whispering, exactly. can't, yes, be yes, exactly. can't be loaned out. Can't be loaned out. Yeah, to himself. Yeah. <laughs> he's like, I'm not sure you actually answered my question. And he's like, 
and you're just like, okay, this guy is hunting desperately to come up with, as, as I don't know as, which one of you just said this, but as like a first year philosophy student being like, I've got to figure out a way to <laughs> steel man this. I don't know what to do here. There's There's got to be a way for me to to negate this argument. And you're like, oh, you're so done. It's over. Um, Has that just been the entire trial, Molly? Is that like, is that been it? Is that a good summary of what we've seen? Just about. Yeah, I would say... <laughs> trying not to answer the questions. And then uh, most of his defense, like the whole defense strategy really has been him going back over things that other witnesses said, events that they recounted, recounting the same events and giving a very different spin on them. And so, you know, there were these very memorable moments in court where like Nishad was testifying about this conversation that they had on this balcony of their penthouse where he was sort of confronting Sam Bankman Freed about this missing eight to ten billion dollars and it was very dramatic and Nishad was so upset and worried and and Sam gives his version of events where he was like we basically just talked about marketing you know and so <laughs> it's like totally different stories coming out on the stand where you're being asked to just totally disbelieve all of these multiple witnesses who have given completely contradictory versions of events. So I would say that's probably the big summary of, of the, the defense so far is just saying like, you just got to believe Sam, everyone else was lying. Do you think there's any reasonable, any, any suggestion or room that you've seen for a possible mistrial here? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's always that possibility, I think. And I think that that might be what he was going for. You know, I think the idea that he would take the stand and suddenly the jury would unanimously find him not guilty of seven charges is just so divorced from reality that, like, it just doesn't seem remotely plausible. But, you know, I could see them hoping that he is somehow personable enough that one juror is like, well, maybe he didn't do it. Or at least I'm not confident enough that he did that I'm willing to say beyond a reasonable doubt. At which point someone could hang the jury, basically, and then, you know, they might have to retry the case. Um, so I think that's a possibility. But hung you know, jury, besides to be that, clear, hung I, I, guess, jury... I guess you asked about a mistrial. Yeah. So that's a separate thing. Well, I think a hung jury yeah, is far... much, much more likely that you can at least get hung up on a few of these counts. I think there's seven counts in total. Like, yeah, you can you can get hung up on one or two of those, maybe. But like, also, a lot of these counts are directly related to one another, right? Like, it's multiple counts of wire fraud. It's multiple counts of bank fraud. Like, I don't think that these jurors are going to be like, well, you are guilty of this count of bank fraud. But these other counts of bank fraud, I don't think so. I, I just don't see it playing out that way. Maybe anything's possible. Meanwhile, I do think when there's one count of money laundering or something, maybe they get hung up on that. That's possible. But mm -hmm. from what I yeah. can tell, in terms of a mistrial, in terms of anything... <laughs> yeah, sorry. I did the it's I okay. did the no. Sam Bankman fried thing where I answered the question <laughs> I wanted to hear. And a hung jury, to be clear, is a type of mistrial that can result in a retrial on the charges they're hung on. Just for any... any for sure. Technical people watching. Any we legal be people clear. watching. Any lawyers. Yeah. <laughs> none, of, none of us are lawyers. We just all like to commentate on things. <laughs> Sam Lincoln Freed also at one point said on the stand that he's not a lawyer, in case anyone was wondering that. That was very funny. <laughs> I think we all understood that when um, the objection sustained moment happened and he decided to answer oh, the God. question anyway. I think everyone yes. was well aware that he is not a lawyer. Or when he tried to say that maybe his answer wasn't admissible and the judge was like, let me worry about that. <laughs> <laughs> he is maybe a banker, though. If not a lawyer, he's a banker, at least, though, right? He ran well, a bank. I heard there was a bank run, so FTX must have been a bank, I guess. Yeah, so I don't know about, like, a mistrial that would, like, basically prevent the case from being retried. I don't, I don't really know. I don't know if I know enough about the specifics of how that would happen to to really opine on that. Yeah, I mean, as far as so just as far as I know, and I also am not a lawyer. <laughs> um, but as far as I know, you need something not pretty legal advice, not right? financial advice. <laughs> right, right. But as far as I know, you need something very egregious. You need a defense team that is utterly incompetent. You need evidence that hasn't actually been given to the defense team or you need like things that are very egregious to occur where there's a mistrial and they're like, oh my gosh, we have to throw the whole case out. Like that, mm -hmm. the chances that's going to happen here are so, so minuscule. It's 
hard to imagine. Um, as you said, hung, hung jury, far different because we would have to know what's going on in the heads of all of these jurors and we right. can't. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, everyone involved in this case from a legal perspective has been very careful about sort of crossing their T's and dotting their I's. There's been a lot of procedural stuff that looks very intended for that purpose. I think some people have spoken about incompetent defense just in the sense that some people, you know, really are having trouble, myself included, honestly, understanding what his defense team's strategy is. It seems like it's been very haphazard. They are just sort of throwing stuff out there. You know, they during a lot of their cross-examination, they would do stuff where they would begin to ask questions and it would look like they were getting somewhere and then they would just sort of abandon that train of thought before they got anywhere with it. So some people have you know, been saying that like the defense team is doing such a bad job that it, he could get this incompetent uh, defense mistrial, which I think is really not the case. Like, you have to have a really egregiously incompetent defense, I think, for that to fly. And this is just that, like, there isn't a good defense to offer, and they're doing the best they can with what they have. But that's not incompetence. You know, that's just, you can't, it's hard to defend someone who doesn't have a strong case, you know? And somebody who went out and did a media tour and did, you know, like, all this all this stuff that, that Sam Bankman-Fried did really hurt his own ability to defend himself and for any any lawyer team to defend him. So yeah, I agree with you there in general. The last bit I want to bring up is that the other conspiracy theory still getting thrown around is this idea that there's going to be a presidential pardon for Sam Bankman-Fried. Well, why would there be a, a presidential pardon for Sam Bankman-Fried? I'm just going to run through the conspiracy theorist line of thinking here for, for anyone who's listening. Why would he do that? Well, he, Sam Bankman-Fried was like one of the top, I don't know if it was the number one or the top two donors, second. the second biggest donor to the Democratic Party and Joe Biden in the presidential run-up. He's donated to all kinds of Democrats. He's donated to all kinds of Democratic causes. Oh, well, isn't that reason enough to grant him a presidential pardon? So, Molly, can you tell me why that's not necessarily the brightest line of thinking? I think that is so out there. I mean, that's like flat earther type of conspiracy theory. That's not like... I mean, that's so, I think, detached from reality. It's true that Sam Bankman fried made a lot of donations to the Democrats. He also made a lot of donations to Republicans. He was making a lot of donations to causes he thought, or to, you know, p politicians he thought would benefit him. He was mostly just donating to crypto politicians is sort of what it came down to. He was doing this strategic thing where he wanted to try to make sure he was supporting people on both sides um, that were friendly to crypto. And, you know, he definitely did make large donations to Democrats, but like, I don't, I think it's being overstated a little bit because his public donations were the ones to Democrats and his dark donations are the ones that came out later. And those were a little bit more bipartisan, let's just say. Um, so I think the, the whole idea that like, oh, he spent a lot of money, he basically bought himself a pardon is really just not plausible. There are a lot of people who have donated a lot of money to causes and still are charged with crimes. I think it's reasonable to say that like money definitely buys you an advantage when it comes to the legal system. You know, you might be less likely to be charged in the first place or, you know, all these different things like that. But once there is this strong case against you, which the government has pretty much nailed you on, the idea that you're just going to have this get out of free card, get out of jail free card that you can pull out of your back pocket because of past donations, I think is just really quite unreasonable. I think it was really valuable there that you highlighted that Sam Bankman-Fried explicitly talked about how his goal was to give as much to Republicans as to Democrats, and that he was really just trying to buy influence. And I think the other dynamic that Cass and I have talked about on here that is regularly forgotten is that at a certain level, those donations mean that politicians are now in a position where they cannot easily like show deference towards Sam Bankman-Fried because the attention is on them now. If Biden, whoever, were to try to 
show some amount of seeming preference towards Joe Biden after these donations. You're giving away multiple news cycles for that decision. And in exchange, you get a broke fraudster who's been separated from most of his centers of power, influence, and wealth, right? It's not a trade that makes sense politically, even if you assume every political actor is like a craven EV maximizer. I think that's actually the most important part that you bring up right there, Bennett, is that if if SBF leaves jail tomorrow, he leaves jail a broke kind of pariah. Nobody wants anything to do with Sam Bankman-Fried. No one wants to work with him. He doesn't have a bunch of money. He doesn't have a bunch of sideline cash that he can give to politicians again to be like, thank you so much for giving me this presidential pardon. There are examples in the past of politicians like Bill Clinton giving Mark Rich, presidential yeah. pardons to people like Mark Rich, um, where it, it pretty much was bribery. I mean, it's hard to look at it as anything else, where you have a top donor to the Democrats and Bill Clinton... And then he gets a presidential pardon right before Bill Clinton gets out of office. And then he gets to be a billionaire, a free billionaire who can still donate freely to the Clintons and to the Democratic Party. So I, there are past examples, but the requirement there is that Mark Rich left prison a rich man still, a rich and influence, influential man, whereas... Sam Bankman-Fried has nothing. So there's no good reason to right. pardon this guy. Well, and even in the Mark Rich example, like what, three months after the pardon, Bill Clinton was quoted as saying like, yeah, that really wasn't worth the headache for me or the party. This was a dumb choice. And like, we can debate whether or not Bill Clinton's statements to newspapers and in public are an accurate representation of what he thinks and believes. But like, even there in that case where this person he was releasing was still powerful, there was a huge amount of blowback that had significant significant costs. Yeah. And I was just going to say also, you know, with a presidential campaign coming up, if Biden just like jumped out and pardoned Sam Bankman Freed right now, the degree of scandal that he would be inviting in doing so before a presidential campaign is like, it makes no sense. There's, there's absolutely no, yeah. I think, again, I think this is just like so far fetched that it's almost like not even <laughs> I, worth discussing. I know, it's, I like, know. <laughs> I, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's no, no, just no. That... I get it. I get so many people like in my Twitter replies that are like, he's going to he's going to get off on all these counts or he's going to. Yeah. Just like all this all this stuff like that. And I think people are really jaded about the justice system for very good reason. Uh, and especially when it comes to people who have money. But I also think that, to, you know, the likelihood of him just suddenly being found not guilty on all seven counts after that strong of a case and that weak of a defense, it's it's just unreasonable i think <laughs> 100 percent, 100 percent agree with you on that um and yes there's reason to be cynical about the u.s justice system right. if that's if that's the discussion we're having um but on that note i do want to say uh, a couple things one molly white does web3 is going great so we haven't plugged her uh website yet web3 is going just great uh it is a beautiful resource for anyone who wants to just check on all the craziness that is constantly going on in cryptocurrency and Web3 and whatever you want to call it. Um, so that's a fabulous resource for anyone out there. But also, Molly, you've been doing these really wonderful live streams. I don't know if that's only for the court case or if this is something you're going to keep doing where it'll be like weekly or something like that. Either way, I have very much enjoyed those. They've been super insightful. If anyone wants to just hear someone recap their time every day after the the court cases highly recommend checking out molly white's youtube channel so we'll link to that too in our show notes is there anything you want to um shill i guess without, without being so crass <laughs> yeah so i also write a newsletter um that's newsletter.mollywhite.net which is a more frequent um update on things and a little bit of a longer form uh, format, then Web3 is going just great. The live streams have mostly just been for the trial because after I get out of the courthouse after eight hours, it's like my brain just is melting out of my ears. And so it's easier for me to just talk rather than try to write something coherent at that point. Um, but I might try to do some more stuff like that. So yeah, stay tuned. <laughs> awesome. Okay, great. Well, that that was fantastic. Uh, thank you for joining us, Molly. We have one more guest coming. I'm I, I'm just going to mention it because we've mentioned her in pretty... This is the only episode where we didn't mention her. Uh, next episode, we will be... Next episode covering the trial, we will be having Elizabeth Lopato on. So please, everyone, tune in for that because she is, honest to God, probably my favorite journalist in the whole world. So please, she's going to have a lot to say about it. And she's always insightful and wonderful. Mm -hmm. 